Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another edition. And I just want to thank all of you that are listening to the podcast and the feedback that I get. I'm talking to myself here, right? And um, it's disheartening to know that that there are folks really listening and enjoying and, and benefiting from this. So thank you. Today, I thought it would be interesting to talk about grief, something I've never talked about the podcast. And I'm wondering when I say the word grief, what, uh, what comes to mind for you? What's, um, what are the thoughts? I mean, my mind goes directly to piercing, overwhelming, emotional pain experienced from the death of somebody cherished or close to me perhaps someone losing a parent, losing a child or a spouse, partner, or a really close friend. You know, grief is pain. It's not the pain of a a physical malady like a disease or a traumatic injury. But the mental pain from grief can be I think just as bad, if not in some ways worse. I looked up the definition of grief, and it's defined as mental suffering over affliction or loss, sharp sorrow, and painful regret. It's also defined as trouble, difficulty, or annoyance, an annoyance. Mayo Clinic, I got on their site, and they suggest that a grieving person might find themselves feeling numb and removed from daily life, unable to carry on with regular duties while saddled with their sense of loss. I thought that was interesting, especially the feeling numb, because I think a lot of us in recovery, financial therapy, therapy circles, or that have some uh, inner awareness can identify feeling numb as not feeling, right? That's uh, when protective parts of me say, this is way too overwhelming. The feelings are too intense, and we are going to just numb out. I used to think that feeling numb was the goal. Like you had arrived if you don't feel anything, if you're numbed out. (laughs) I guess I've come a long way from those days. But that's with prolonging the grief or the process of grieving. So I would suggest that grief itself isn't an emotion. And I probably get some pushback for that. In fact, if I, I'm going to bring up my uh, nonviolent communication list of feelings that um, I keep right beside my, on one of my computers. And I just want to see if grief is one of the feelings. And I, it's not jumping out at me that grief is listed as a feeling on this list. So my contention is that grief is a constellation of many emotions, right? Fear, terror, sadness, just um, pain. Grief is listed. Grief is listed under feelings when your needs are not satisfied. So that makes some sense. So 
I guess we won't split hairs over that, but I think there there's a lot of feelings associated with grief. And Mayo says that grief is the natural reaction to loss. So I think that's that's really what we're talking about with grief. We're talking about a loss. And loss is an inherent certainty of the human experience. It just can't be avoided. And it's something, you know, that we just can't control. We cannot control the inevitability of losses in life. So I would suggest that significant loss includes the loss of anything that overwhelms. It can be the loss of a relationship, violations or trauma to our physical body, the loss of our autonomy or freedom, the loss of a possession, and it certainly can be financial. In fact, I'd suggest that every loss, including the loss of a loved one, is also a financial loss in some form or fashion. And that makes sense. So we say that um, money touches everything. It's a 21st century survival skill. So it would make sense that money touches loss. So as financial planner and a financial therapist, witnessing a client in some form, some continuum of grief over a financial loss is pretty common. Financial losses, specific financial losses, include the loss of a job, a business failure, a poor investment decision, the loss of a significant financial asset like a car, a home, cash, collectibles, or say precious metals. There can be a lot of financial losses. And I also think financial losses include the death or disability of an income earner or breadwinner. So the difference of the loss of a loved one from the financial aspect of a loss that is that financial losses can be insured against to minimize the financial impact of a loss. So while insurance can mitigate the financial loss, there, there's no way that insurance can remove the emotional pain of that loss. Uh, while money can replace things, money can't replace people, of course, and money can't replace the uh, attachments of memories to what's lost. For example, my kids made me various things through their life. Some are behind me on my bookshelves. A ceramic piece of a girl fishing, I probably could buy hundreds of pieces like that. But that piece given to me by one of my children just couldn't be replaced. And, and the loss would be emotional. So when we have losses, when we are in grief or grieving, it's really crucial that person moves through the process of grieving and doesn't resist it, deny it, suppress it, which is so understandable because of the intent, intense emotions. And in, a, in IFS terms, what, what of course we're dealing with here, uh, are those vulnerable parts of us that are feeling so in, intense, intensely that are feeling the, the trauma of the loss. And so all sorts of protectors are understandably coming in saying, no, we're not going to do that. But doing that, inevitably prolongs the grieving process. So much of the work of therapy, of financial therapy or traditional therapy, is dealing with intense periods of loss 
that have been locked away in our psyche, exiled, as it were. And this is usually referred to by some therapists as unfinished business, because the business of working through or finishing, resolving the lost is left undone. So finishing unfinished business often results in opening the emotional wound and fully experiencing the emotional depth of the loss. Now, there's no wonder why, why we resist this. I mean, <laughs> just, just talking about opening an emotional wound, you know, who wants to open a wound? Well, if the wound is healing, that's one thing. But if the wound is infected and not healing, as in the case of unfinished business, a wound caused, an emotional wound caused by unfinished business, then it, it eventually is necessary. And doing this is a type of what's called exposure therapy. Catherine Shear, who's a psychiatry professor at Columbia University, has developed a 16-week program of psychotherapy that adapts exposure therapy techniques. And exposure therapy is often used for victims of trauma. But she uses this to help clients deal with and resolve grief. And when I first heard about this, which, which actually I've heard about it in the past, but I never thought of some forms of therapy as being exposure therapy. And I can think of several therapeutic modalities, and this is not comprehensive, and you may well think of others that would incorporate a form of exposure therapy, like um, psychodrama, MD, EMDR, and IFS. Exposure therapy is a therapy developed to help people confront their fears. And uh, when people are fearful of something, they tend to avoid the feared object or the activity or the situations. So revisiting the painful details in advance of a loss is a type of exposing yourself to the intense feelings that have been mentally locked away. I think of an example of this that, that I've used and written about is Ebenezer Scrooge from Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And if you remember that carol, that, that story, Scrooge is visited by three ghosts who are basically told that they will um, present to him uh, the keys of transforming. And the very first one is the ghost of Christmas past. And the ghost of Christmas past took Scrooge back in time to witness the losses that he had long buried. They were around his father's emotional neglect, the loss of the love of his life, Fran, I think it was. And he lost her from through his workaholism. And I, I'm also thinking the loss of the joy that he once had from his profession uh, working for Fezziwick. So this is a type of, or a great example of unfinished business. And if you remember, Scrooge uh, felt all of this. It, uh, it, it, some of the scenes he trembled, the text says, and uh, cried and fully experienced the emotions that were unfinished, unresolved, unprocessed from those losses. So, um, how long does grieving last? Uh, well, wish we were all Scrooge. <laughs> he got it all done in one night, right? Oh, wow. The, the uh, Mayo Clinic site says that mourning, the grieving process, can last for months or years. And this kind of perked my interest because according to a very recent New York Times article uh, published in uh, 
March of 2022, entitled, How Long Should It Take to Grieve? Psychiatry has come up with an answer. And it was written by Ellen Berry, and I also was able to hear her interviewed on uh, by Michael Smirkanish about this piece. And according to this, if the grieving process takes even a year for an adult, it is now no longer considered a normal process, but a mental disorder. Six months for children. Who says this? Well, it's called the DSM-5, which is the Bible of Psychiatric Diagnosis. And they recently added a mental health diagnosis called prolonged grief disorder, which by their definition is someone who is incapacitated, pining and ruminating a year after a loss and unable to return to previous activities. Well, that's interesting. What that means is a clinician, a therapist, psychologist can now bill an insurance company for treating people with this condition, this disorder. The article, which is well worth reading if you're interested in that, kind of lays out proponents and op opponents to this. Uh, proponents cheered the inclusion of the disorder, prolonged grief disorder, will open up funding for both individual psychotherapy and by insurance companies uh, researching uh, treatments. It will also open up a way of prescribing drugs to treat grieving. So it will allow your insurance to pay for sessions. It will open up research into grieving and make way for pres prescribing drugs to treat grieving. Opponents can be pretty strong in condemning this as they really recoil from making grief, viewed as very natural in the human condition, a mental illness, by arguing that doing this is uh, pathologizing a fundamental aspect of the human experience. Well, that makes sense. And I guess it's not saying all grief and grieving is a mental disorder. It's just if it goes beyond 12 months. So I, I suppose I could spend a lot of time talking about that, the pros and the, and the cons. But I, I want to uh, move on to um, just saying that being emotionally immobilized in grief can be really financially damaging. It can limit a person's ability to make sound and clear financial decisions and, quote, get on with their, with their life. Regardless of how long the grieving process takes, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months, two years, five years, moving through and not being stuck and when I think of being stuck, I can think of being numbed out, uh, stuck in, in that grieving the losses can just be very important to regaining objectivity, which helps us obtain financial well-being. I mean, it's pretty critical that a person who is unable to make objective financial decisions has somebody in their life reaches out to someone for help moving through this process. It's crucial that they find someone that they can trust by, uh, financially to help them with making the decisions or bounce the decisions that they're making off of them while they move through the grieving process. It's, it's pretty dangerous to be making financial decisions when a person is in a period of intense grief. I used to have a rule of thumb for a grieving spouse of not making any serious, serious life decision for two years uh, after the death of a spouse. Now, that's not hard and fast, but it's important that a person gives themselves some space 
Uh, Susan Bradley calls it the decision free zone where big, big decisions are not made. I mean, sometimes they have to be made, but preferably like selling the house, moving to another state, changing careers, things of, of that type. So how does someone move through the grieving process? I'm sure there's books written on this, right? I think it's important to understand that everyone's experience or timing will not be the same. And this is one of the objections with the DSM-5 inclusion of prolonged grieving disorder, that people move through this differently. And I think probably the longer a person puts off feeling the intense feelings, the longer the process can be. But it's not the same. It's not the same process for everybody. It's on a continuum. Uh, you know, some losses are not as impactful as others. The same loss happening to two individuals can have a very different impact. For example, a job loss for one person who's identified themselves through their work, who, say, had no emergency fund, who live month to month might be devastating. And for another who lost their job and viewed it dispassionately, was a job, uh, was maybe in an industry with multiple job opportunities doing the same thing, who had the financial capacity to sustain their lifestyle while out of work, that person arguably would suffer much less, if at all. The Times article noted that grief isn't a problem to be solved, but a process to be lived through, whatever form it may take. It is a transition, and we're always in transition in our, in our lives. But grief, especially significant from a significant loss, can be a major transition. And any transition has three stages. An ending of what was, a period of passage while we relate and adapt to that change, which can be really messy, and eventually a new beginning, a new normal. And uh, I don't know if I've talked much about this on the podcast, but there's actually a designation that recognizes a person who's had training in transition, especially financial transitions. It's called a Certified Financial Transitionist, a CEFT. That's given by the Financial Transitionist Institute, which was founded by Susan Bradley. A person that's gone through this um, program and earned this certification is specifically trained and has tools to help people move through the financial aspects of grieving. Where do you look for this? Well, a lot of financial therapists and financial planners actually have this training. So it's something to look for and you can go to her site. Uh, I think the site you'd find by going to Sudden Money will have a, a listing of people who are trained in um, financial transitioning. How can we uh, help somebody who's in the grieving process? Often we avoid folks because it really triggers our unresolved grief from our losses. I think it's really important that we reach out to people that are grieving, especially weeks and months after the initial shock. Oftentimes a person can be overwhelmed with offers to help initially, but it's the weeks and months following that can be so lonely and dark. Another thing is just it's really important to be with the person. It's important to listen. If you're worried about what you can say, it's probably better to say very little. And it's, it's important to avoid trite faith Phrases like, you know, they're in a better place, or the Lord needed another angel in heaven, or it was God's will, you're so strong, or you have so much to be thankful for, everything will be okay. All of those, while well-intentioned, 
can be received by somebody in grief as minimizing and condescending. It's just best to listen and ask them, how's this been for you? Another thing you can do is offer to take on helping them with immediate chores and tasks that need attention. This can be a lot. Financially, this could be bill paying, making deposits, working with insurance agents, uh, organizing a fundraiser, uh, just helping them with financial decisions. And finally, you can maybe help gently nudge them to get into a support group, a grieving support group. There's many of those. Or um, get in with a therapist or even a financial therapist. And doing this can significantly move a person through this process. Okay, I'm going to need to stop there. I hope this was um, helpful. And I look forward to being with you again next week. Take care. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.